Imagine as qualidades necessárias para a construção de uma carreira para lá de bem sucedida em setores tão distintos quanto mineração, telecomunicações, transportes, indústria do petróleo ou setor financeiro. Determinação, resiliência em situações adversas, capacidade de adaptação, de trabalhar em equipe e de liderar. Esses atributos todos também podem ter importância para um bom militar. Em dobro, se esse militar quiser integrar uma das tropas de assalto mais exigentes do mundo, a Legião Estrangeira. A tropa de elite francesa, imortalizada com um certo romantismo num filme de 1939 estrelado por Gary Cooper, reúne quase 10 mil homens de 140 nacionalidades diferentes. Uma escola onde se aprendem lições duras que também podem ser úteis na vida civil. Junte essas qualidades e ainda uma paixão pela aventura e temos o retrato entrevistado deste milênio. Aos 80 anos, o inglês Simon Murray construiu uma impressionante carreira profissional e até hoje atua no setor de petróleo. E sim, na juventude, foi legionário e falou ao milênio dessa experiência. Successful businessman in lots of different fields, in lots of different countries, but also a sportsman, an adventurer. Uh, what sort of definition suits you the more? What do you like to be called? <laughs> do you know, I have not actually thought about that. <coughs> um, I'm certainly not an officer and a gentleman. Uh, I, I think a well-rounded person who's um, gone into life, not waited for life to come to me. I've gone forward. There's a guy, um, uh, Yuri Geller, mm -hmm. says, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> I've been doing that. <laughs> And looking back at your, at your early life, you, as a young British uh, student, a man, you decided to go and to uh, enroll in the Légion étrangère, the special corps of the French armed forces that uh, goes first when France is involved in any sort of combat situation or wars and things like that. This was, and it's made of plenty of foreigners, as the name said. What, what has made you decide to enroll? The question of, to a legionnaire, why did you join the legion? There is a standard answer, okay? And it's short. I joined to forget. <laughs> you would then say, what were you trying to forget? Yeah. I will say, I don't know. I've forgotten because the system <laughs> works, okay? <laughs> I think it was a, a process of lots of different things and probably too long to answer now. Mm -hmm. I had not uh, robbed a bank or anything like that. Um, I had seen the, the film of Beaugest, mm -hmm. which we all had. Uh, made by Gary Cooper in 1936. Yeah. I had read the book. Uh, I tried to join the British Army. I only wanted to join one regiment, the Gurkhas. They said I was green and red colorblind. I could not. I was bored with what I was doing. I was working in an iron foundry in Manchester. The only good thing in the iron foundry was the chairman's daughter. Uh, <laughs> she didn't want to know at that time. When I came out of the Legion, yes, and we'd been married for 53 years, so that all It Pardon worked it. out again. It worked out again. So I, I don't, uh, 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 maybe to get off the path, I, I don't believe that is the way forward. I believe to get off the path you're on, get into some space where there is nothing. Find yourself. When you find yourself, you are a free man. I am a free man. have always been a free man. But among the <laughs> things that you've done, you've been uh, to war, more specifically yep. the Algerian war, the independence war of Algeria. Uh, the end of the colonial rule, French rule there. And at that time, and still nowadays, the Légion and France itself, but Légion specifically is criticized. It is praised for, uh, by some people saying that it's the outstanding military corps with an impressive training and impressive men uh, in its ranks. And the critics would say, this is a corps of uh, mercenaries and they fight because they want some money. What would you say to those people? I, I would say that is wrong. You do not join the Legion for money, which is what mercenaries do. Mm -hmm. The last thing you get in the Legion is after a month, you get about the equivalent of $20 or something. When I first joined, you do not join for money. 
okay? You join for the experience or whatever it is. You join for the adventure. You may join because you're running away. Mm -hmm. You may be running away from a wife who's giving you hell. <laughs> you, may be, you may have done something wrong. You may have robbed a bank, okay? They don't ask for passports, there are no papers. But the Legion is not looking for criminals. If they know you are a criminal, they will not accept you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nobody wants an army full of criminals. What did you bring with you that you learned, the lessons that you learned, or the way of behaving that you learned in the Legion, that somehow, if there was anything like that, helped you in such a successful career? I don't think that I am conscious of any particular thing that the Legion gave to me. I was 18 years old. I came out when I was 24. So, uh, yes, it was a tough experience. We were in the mountains. We were searching out for the Felica and so on. We had accrochage. We had... The punishments were very brutal, very tough, etc. All that is in there, yes. But I think, uh, you know, I don't think it made me a man and made me strong or something. None of that stuff. Subconsciously, I think you are on your own feet. So, yes, the Legion was an experience that everybody regards as something very special. Some people think it's not very good, some people think it's wonderful, okay? Mm -hmm. For me, the Legion was made me, in a way, what I am. I am what I am. Talking about your business career, you yeah. went very early on uh, to Asia, working there, <laughs> yes. to Hong Kong yeah. and, and stuff, and you worked in uh, telecom, you worked in uh, energy, you worked in uh, oil, you still work in uh, the oil industry, but lots of different fields where you had to adapt. Looking from your point of view in Hong Kong, uh, what sort of things do you think that the Asian way, the Chinese, the Asian way of doing business helped you to build this impressive <coughs> career? Asian values are the same values that we had in England and so on in the last century. We feel we've lost a lot of those values, okay? They are very straightforward, loyalty. Uh, honesty, truth, and so on, trust. We didn't have to have lawyers in the old days. Every time we did a deal, mm -hmm. we could shake hands. I personally represented a Japanese consortium to build the Singapore Mass Transit Railway System. The consortium was Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Kawasaki, and so on, Hitachi, the consortium. We won the contract. I had not even a piece of paper that I was their agent. They paid me a commission for 11 years without me ever asking for it. That's trust, okay? Now, I've been with American companies and so on, and Swedish companies and Asia who argue. I, I didn't say your commission was 1.5%. I said it was 1% discussion. Mm -hmm. I once had a Swedish company. I got them a contract to build the new Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. The boss came to see me in front of my staff. I only had three members of the staff. And he said, Simon, we can't pay you the 1.5% commission because we've had to reduce our price. So we're going to pay you 1%. I said, look, you pay me 1.5%. If the price goes down, my 1.5% also goes down. It's 1.5%. No, we're not going to pay you 1.5%. In that case, you pay me nothing. Nothing? It's 1% one one, or nothing, Simon. Good. Nothing. I got nothing. A very valuable contract when my company was very young. My staff were amazed. What are you doing? You're throwing money out of the window. Five years later, I'm running one of the biggest companies in Hong Kong, Li Ka Shin's company. Mm -hmm. That same Swedish company came to do the, uh, the, the, the construction for us for the same, for the same contract mm -hmm. that they had on the bank. I allowed the head of my property company to take them all the way through. Everything's done, the drawings, the, the, the quotation. And, and the last. And they got to the end, vetoed. I said, no, we're not dealing with them. I let them run all the way through, thinking they're going to get the contract. Nothing. Say, so, yeah, I'm a horrible guy, but I mean, one has to do these things. Consequences. So you, you, you started working in Hong Kong still in the 1960s. Hong Kong was uh, a British colony at that time. Yes, yes. Uh, it changed a lot. Uh, in the <coughs> 1990s, it yes. uh, was uh, given back to China. But did you have, at some point at that time, the idea that it would be from Hong Kong that what came to be this powerful China of nowadays uh, would come the protests, uh, the dissent, the questioning of a whole system that it's basically ruling a very substantial part of the uh, world economy? Yeah, no, I did not. I did not. I think that as we got nearer to 1997, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We were having, uh, obviously, our concerns and our worry and so on, discussing with China. Deng, Deng Xiaoping was the boss of China. He was reasonable, and it was him who came up with one country, two systems. We could accept that. And you say it's changed a lot. Funnily enough, it has not changed nearly as much as you think. Okay, I've been there 53 years mm -hmm. and so on. Now, the protesters are not protesting uh, about Hong Kong being not what it was or something. The protesters are protesting because they want more, uh, uh, they want a better deal. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is the most different, uh, the, the, the separation between the haves and have not is larger in Hong Kong than anywhere else in the world. I know people in Hong Kong who receive a dividend every year of five billion dollars. Five a billion. US dollars dividend. There is no tax on dividend in Hong Kong. These people are sometimes very generous with their money. But think of that compared with the young guy who gets a job and he's being paid two bucks. I was reading and I've heard, uh, watching some interviews of yours, uh, recent interviews, people talking about this new so called Chinese era. And you were arguing that you wouldn't believe that uh, there is actually. Uh, the foundations and the conditions to have a Chinese era. But we had an American era, let's say, in the previous century. We had a, a, a British era, if we think about the British Empire, and then earlier on, uh, maybe a Portuguese and Spanish era uh, in the 16th and 17th century. Why don't you think that uh, we are in the brink of a Chinese era? I don't think that I don't think. Mm -hmm. The world is round and it goes around. We also had a Chinese era, 2,000 years ago and That's so on true. and so forth. So all these things come and go, okay? Why I was thinking it is time, China's time, uh, let's say in the early 80s, and they've already made the decision to take Hong Kong back. Uh, they are starting to grow at 25% per annum growth, economic growth, 25% per annum. China became the workshop of the world in the 80s, okay? But then politics get in the way. And... Uh, so sanctions and Americans and people trying to squash China. So China is now growing at 4% per annum, 5% per annum. And that is too little to feed its own people. China has 700 million people, 700 million people who live on two bucks a day. They have 157 million diabetics growing at 10% per annum. That means it doubles every seven years. So in 14 years, they're going to have 600 million diabetics. Diabetics destroys your immune system, mm -hmm. apart from anything else. China has huge problems, huge problems. So its growth is going down and so on. It, I think that China will become something very, very... It is, it is important. Right. One and a half million, billion people. It's three times, four times, five times bigger than the United States. But it's managed by one guy. Mm -hmm. There's the problem with China. One guy. Corruption is huge. He's destroying, he's solving corruption, he says. You have religious issues, you have pharmacy, health issues, you have hundreds and hundreds of issues, okay? So it's going to take time, but it's the second biggest economy in the world today, mm -hmm. but slowing. Today, you, you live your life, and during the year, uh, a bit of time here in China, some other time in other places, and of course in Britain, your, yeah. your home country. How have you seen, from all these different uh, perspectives, uh, this whole process of Brexit? What went wrong, or was it really uh, inevitable that something like that would happen? Is this the end of the European dream, in your opinion? I, I, I think the, it, it, it's certainly going in that direction, because we have left, and others will be watching us. And if we are successful, economically and socially, whatever, in England, I think there are plenty of others who will say, why can't we be like that? Brussels, why is it in Brussels? What is Brussels? Okay, the average Englishman does not know the difference between the Commission and the Parliament. He votes for members of Parliament, but he doesn't realize it is the Commission that makes the laws. And the Commission, he does not vote for the people in the Commission. They are appointed, and very often they are failures, political failures in their own country. And the Commission makes 70 laws a, a year. How high the fence is around my garden, my pool, etc. We pay $49 billion a year towards this in Brussels. Who are these guys? What are they telling us to do? We can do this and we can't do that. 
But those who defend this idea of an European bloc, strong one, a, a yeah. club of strong nations yes. and economies that would help the ones that are weaker and stuff like that, say that the uh, European Union also prevented Europe to go into uh, lots of different wars, if we don't talk about okay. Yugoslavia, of course. What would you say for them? Uh, is, is there a place for a, a, a communion of countries in, in that sense, if you take out bureaucracy, let's say? It was formed by seven countries with one objective, to make sure we have no more wars in Europe. We were kept out of it. De Gaulle did not want us in. We came in later, in 65. Yes. So then it became a trade. We're going to trade together. That's fine. But now we've gone miles past that, making laws. Who can do this? Who can do that? So it's become, and it's centered, of course, on France and Germany. Nothing against France and Germany, but that's where it's becoming. Who's going to be the boss? I don't think we can imagine. We can imagine. I don't think we would like to be part of a federal a Europe with a German federal government. And memories are too strong. Mm -hmm. We may love them today, but memories are too strong. You worked in so many different fields, as I said. Apart from those that I already cited, uh, you also work in the financing in the <coughs> Deutsche Bank, and you also worked, uh, you founded a company, a, a communication company that start, came to be one of the biggest uh, in the world, also Orange. Uh, how did you adapt from sector to sector? Is there a basic formula that you can uh, work <laughs> in oil, you can work in energy, you can work in finance? Is there a set of uh, rules and things that you do that you can adapt to different sectors? It, it is, it is a, a leadership which is required more than the knowledge of the product. The people who you have working for you know more about the product than, than I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I make sure of that. And because I've been in all these different businesses, I, I've been a banker twice. I don't know anything about banking. I've been in the telephone business. I hardly know how a telephone works. I do understand Morse code, but I, et cetera. But the people around me, as long as you are running it, and that, that leadership requires an example of fairness, trust, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that I think I have that or understand that, and that's why I can go into more or less any job. Mm -hmm. Altogether, with this amazing career in business, you've developed also a, a career, let's say, uh, as an adventurer, a sportsman. And I want to ask you also about that. But we're going to do this in the next segment of this millennium, okay? okay. Simon, also, during your career, whilst you were being a businessman on the building, on the making, you also turned out to be uh, an adventurer. How was that? How did it come that uh, at some point you managed to go to the South Pole and to walk more than 1,000 kilometers unsupported to become the oldest man, oldest human being to reach the South Pole at 63 on yourself? When, when I was... Uh a boy, we didn't have television, I read books. And we had a thing called the British Empire. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it was even bigger than the French Empire. And uh, I read the books about the explorers, Burton and Speak, going to the Nile to find the origin, people climbing mountains, all this stuff. So it's in the spirit uh, of a young man to do all these things, okay? The first movie I ever saw is Scott going to the South Pole and he dies on the way back. Okay, so all these things, I wonder if I could do that, are going through your mind when you are young. When I'm older, I was freer. My, I was running my own company when I went to the South Pole. Going to the South Pole is an adventure for me. I like adventure. <laughs> and uh, apparently the spirit of uh, adventure, <laughs> yeah. uh, let's call it like that, attracts uh, the people that are of the same kind because your wife also was a helicopter pilot and yes. she also flew all over the world yes, with a helicopter. Yes, she's the first woman to fly around the world in a helicopter. I bought a helicopter and I said to my wife, listen, you better learn to be a pilot's wife. If something goes wrong, you know what to do. So you also get what we call a wife's pilot uh, and uh, license. And she went to the airport and stayed there while I was in Hong Kong for four weeks and got herself a license. So she had a license before, before me. Yes. Very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's good because both of you have yes. this license. Yes. Back to business. You were never shy uh, of acting and working 
in the, some fields that are very that can be very tricky. I'm talking about mining. You were the CEO of Glencore for a while. I'm talking about oil and uh, the husk company and working with the, with the Russians and everything. And nowadays, people talk a lot about the climate emergency, what's going on. And this has to do with all these sectors where not only the competition is very hard, but at the same time, we have other questions being asked about how are we going to uh, keep working in these fields without endangering the planet. How is your vision of that? I think to some extent it might be over exaggerated. It's also the economic factor that has to be taken into account. So it's very all very well saying we're going to do it with, with, with windmills and, and, and so on, but the economy is not going to stand for it. It's going to take long, long time, long, long time. What's the best solution for me? Nuclear. Nuclear. But nuclear is very expensive, front end, but it's clean. Mm -hmm. And what if it goes wrong? Well, we have gas explosions, we have mm -hmm. oil fires, we have also, yes, it goes on, Chernobyl. But we find that Chernobyl was human error, not anything to do with the nuclear. Nuclear has no, 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 no waste if you use the right formulas and so on. Plutonium, you can use plutonium to create the nuclear, not as a result of mm -hmm. nuclear. nuclear. So, yeah, we can talk about it for a long time. On the brink of your starting your 80s, yes. still working, still very active, still doing lots of different things <laughs> and going all over the world. What keeps you wanting more? Not more money or more uh, business challenges. This you have a lot in, in your life, both of those. But uh, wanting uh, to, to feed your curiosity, to meet people, to still being very active. Well, I, I don't um, have a bucket list, a list of things I've got to do before I die. I don't have one of those sort of things. I'm getting older, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I have to slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, I think life should be taken at a run mm -hmm. you, you, as fast as you can and get through the other side and go to heaven and play some golf. Mm -hmm. Simon Murray, thank you very much for your interview. Pleasure. Thank okay. you.